Okay, how's it going, everybody? I hope you're all doing well. Okay, well, so in today's episode, I thought I'd try to say something about, well, something about the phenomenon of nostalgia. A phenomenon that's often a, a deep part of our psychic life. Well, okay, so maybe a good place to start, as it usually is, is with the etymology of the word. So nostalgia is made up of two Greek words. The first one is nostos, and the second one is algos. Now, nostos means something like to return home, and algos, well, that means pain or suffering. So uh, nostalgia then is the suffering or the sadness connected with the desire for home. Think of uh, Odysseus in Homer's Odyssey. So what nostalgia is then, in effect, is homesickness. Actually, it's really interesting. I read somewhere that nostalgia, in its actual first usage, was originally referred to as a medical condition. Apparently, it was coined in the 1600s to refer to the radical homelessness that mercenaries from Switzerland experienced, where it was associated with uh, really super bad symptoms like depression and insomnia. Anyway, so, so that's the general idea. But now let's try to get a little bit more comprehensive. So nostalgia being a kind of homesickness is obviously backwards looking. That's to say it looks to the past. And you might even say that it looks to uh, repossess the past. But um, here's the thing. This past, it might be something that's actually historical, but it doesn't have to be. So what I mean is that this backward looking that is nostalgia might point to a real place in the past, like, uh, like I don't know, the, the attic that you used to visit when you were young, or the, uh, the Indiana Jones movie that you saw in a theater. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a place or a time that's grounded in reality like this. For instance, we might feel nostalgia for some lost mythical or primordial paradise, like, say, uh, the Garden of Eden. And um, if you don't know, the historian Mercia Iliadi has quite a bit to say on this particular form of nostalgia. What he argues is that overwhelmed as we sometimes are by our meaningless and profane modern secular existence, what we often have nostalgia for is the state of paradise that we used to live in. That's to say, in our archaic past, a state where, as uh, one commentator put it, we were in communion with the gods and in mystical solidarity with the animals and with nature. And actually, on top of all of this, there's at least another important type of nostalgia as well, one that's been discussed out there. Now, this one's not necessarily the nostalgia for some specific place or for some uh, mythical paradise, but it's for something more subjective, as it's been called. So, for example, it might be about a time in our past when we felt most protected or most confident. So you get the idea. Okay, well, now that we've defined or characterized it a bit, let's explore how it is nostalgia might serve us. What do we get from it? Is it helpful? And um, if so, how exactly? Well, there's no doubt, of course, that nostalgia can often trigger sadness and a sense of loss, but I think it can also be a positive and a beneficial experience. I mean, first of all, I would say that nostalgia is a way for us to recapture some control over our lives in times of uncertainty. It can serve as an escape from our current reality, especially if it's unstable. Through nostalgic remembering, we move back through time to a place, to a sanctuary of security and meaning in the middle of the tempest that is our real life. Now, that's a reassuring feeling. That feeling of being grounded again and recapturing some meaning and some stability. But it's not just about retrieving meaning. It's also about recapturing who it is that we are. 
In other words, nostalgia serves as a way of recovering and then maintaining our identity. Nostalgia finds us when we've become unmoored from ourselves. And sometimes even finding or being presented with an object from our past is enough to do this. It reawakens us to our past and reminds us of the person that we used to be and maybe still are. Deep down, it recalls to us that child in us that wants to breathe and live again. I mean, after all, memories are pretty much geographic in nature, with the two dimensions of time and space, and so they provide the basis of who it is that we are or used to be. What I mean is that, apart from the universal human nature that defines us, we are who we are because we were born and lived at a particular period of time and at a very precise place on Earth. That is, in essence, the, the genesis of our identity. So the point is, is that without our memories of these particular times and places, we pretty much lose our identity and our life transforms into a kind of black hole without any meaning. All this is why nostalgia is often linked to being in a state of exile, as the etymology of the word suggests. It's not only because we've been exiled from something or from some place that we yearn to go home to, but it's also because we've been exiled from ourselves from that person that we'd like to be in touch with again. You know, speaking of all this, I mentioned that sometimes being presented with an object from our past is enough to generate nostalgia. And I can't think of a more famous example of this than what we get in the French novelist Marcel Proust in his novel Swan's Way. So there, what happens is that when Proust's narrator, Marcel, eats the crumb of a Madeleine cookie dipped in lime blossom tea, it triggers a process of remembering which brings much of his past to life again. As soon as he tastes it, this is what he says. He says, No sooner had the warm liquid mixed with the crumbs touched my palate than a shudder ran through me and I stopped, intent upon the extraordinary thing that was happening to me. What happens to him is that he realizes that this particular tasting experience brings to the surface of his consciousness long buried memories. That's to say, all of a sudden he remembers all sorts of details from his, his childhood, including his aunt soaking her madeleines in tea. Actually, it's interesting, it's well established in several studies that taste and smell in particular activate the most powerful autobiographical memories. And uh, the phenomenon is even labeled after the French writer. It's called the Proust effect. Anyway, so, well, I've tried so far to mention some of the positive effects of nostalgia, but of course that's not the whole story about it. I would say that it also does have some potential disadvantages. I mean, one thing that comes to my mind is that it's always possible to overindulge in nostalgia, right? And to overindulge in such a way that it takes away from the present moment, from, from one's life as it is right now. That's to say, when we overglorify some moment in our past, we take away from extracting what we can from the present. So, it could be said then that there's an important difference and a fine line between incorporating the positive emotions of remembering something into one's present life versus completely sacrificing the present for the sake of constantly reliving some moment in the past. And you know what? Maybe at the end of the day, we can't actually go back, at least not fully. Maybe the moment that we're so nostalgic about is there only in our imagination. Maybe it's a mirage or a wish fulfillment. And even if we can to some extent recapture it, we certainly can't relive it now. As uh, Proust eventually concluded, real paradise 
is a paradise lost. So maybe if the past is always slightly fabricated and not ultimately relivable, maybe it's best to live where there's a little more fidelity and veracity to things and where living is never a dim copy of the past. Maybe it's best to live in the present. Bye for now.